Well, first of all, it's um, I want to thank uh, Western Heritage for creating debates and forums uh, like this. I think uh, many Australians uh, feel that uh, there's not enough political leadership in this country that has a long-term vision. And I think many Australians want to see a vision for our future, and tonight's a great opportunity for that. Um, as I said, I believe Australians want to hear from political leaders, not just uh, a short-term vision, a three-year vision we often hear, but a 10, 20, 30-year vision. And tonight we're talking about effectively a 37-year vision uh, into um, 2050. Uh, those attending here tonight and those that will be watching uh, on TV, um, you really should be commended and acknowledged uh, for showing a keen interest in the future affairs of Australia because... Um, it will be up to all Australians, not any indivi particular individuals that will be required to make any worthwhile vision uh, a reality. Uh, I created 21st Century Australia originally as a movement um, to generate ideas and policies to help move our nation into the 21st century, uh, particularly to leave our outdated uh, 19th century industrialization, uh, education and political systems behind and to create new 21st century systems that perhaps can better serve us as we move towards 2050. Uh, I also wrote a book, 101 Ways to Improve Australia, uh, which initiated many of the policies uh, that uh, 21st Century Australia moved from being a movement uh, to become a political party this year and was hoping to run in the 2013 elections. Uh, but unfortunately, with uh, the AEC bungling, uh, we'll have to wait to 2016 or what may happen could be as early as next year if there's a double disillusion election. Um, many people have a debate in this country, uh, a big Australia or a small Australia by 2050. Um, my um, take on that is that uh, it's the debate's purely academic because I think what you'll see is that Australia is going to be a big Australia in 2050, uh, whether we like it or not. How old will we be in 2050? I'm not sure if you've calculated that yet. 37 years from now, how old will you be? Uh, to look at into the future 2050, I think it's important uh, to also reflect on our past because that often gives us indicators of just how far we can move forward into the future by how far we've already come. 37 years ago was the year 1976. I was three years of age. And in 37 years' time, I'll be 76 years of age in 2050. The world population in 1976 was $4.1 billion, billion, sorry, up from only 370 million people in the 13th century. It's grown to today's world's population as 7.1 uh, billion people. It passed 7 billion uh, just last year. It's predicted by 2050 to be as high as 10.9 billion people on the planet, ranging from 8.7 up to 10.9 billion people. Where's Australia's population? 1976, we had 13.9 million Australians. Today, we have approximately 23 million Australians. In 2050, we have, can have as many as 42 million Australians. Government estimates as low as 35 million but if you follow the historic estimates of the government, they've continually underestimated uh, the population growth of Australia. So we expect it to be closer to the high end of the range of 42 million people by 2050. Uh, that's a big Australia. Sydney, as an example, uh, today has you know, approximately 4.4 million people, the largest city in Australia. It will grow on itself to over 7.5 million people by 2050. If you can see the picture there, that's a futuristic picture of what the city of Sydney will look like in 2050. You can still the, see the Opera House slightly dwarfed by the buildings and the Harbour Bridge there. But it gives you an idea, a visual image of, of what the world has in store for us and what our cities and country may look like in 2050. Melbourne's population at 3.9 million today will grow to as much as 6.4 million. And cities such as Brisbane uh, will more than double in population from 2.2 million today to over 4.5 million people by 2050. As you can imagine, the cost of living is likely to rise substantially. 
as it's already a high cost of living, even in 2013. To give you an indication, house prices, on average at the moment in Sydney, are medium house prices, almost $600,000. $600, this is expected to grow to as much as eight to $10 million for a typical home by the year 2050. Might be a good idea to buy a house now and not wait to 2050. The low, a cost of a loaf of bread by 2050 could be as much as $40. By 2050, as you can imagine, the world would have changed dramatically. For instance, this is Boeing's future hypersonic plane they intend to have released by 2050. It's already in planning stage. Will you actually be able to see outside as you're flying along? Such planes. Will be out, you'll be able to travel from Sydney to London in as little as 90 minutes by the year 2050. Space trips to the edge of space, possibly the moon, with already people purchasing today tickets to go into the edge of space. By 2050, more people will become techno savvy in a fully wide world. Smartphones, which we have now, the internet, global trade and automatic language translators are giving birth to a much more interdependent humanity. Focus on improving health care and raising living standards. Breakthroughs in stem cell development emerge on an almost daily basis. My vision for 2050 for Australia and the world is quite positive if we are able to tackle the challenges that lay ahead. Medical success, nanotech and strong artificial intelligence by 2050 will empower humanity. It will regenerative medicine regrows organs and tissues, replacing lost limbs and other failed body parts. Many boomers and seniors, despite getting up in their years, enjoy near perfect health in the, in the 2050s. And the prospect for an indefinite lifespan in the not so distant future are now accepted by mainstream doctors everywhere. Industrialization spreads worldwide, collision proof driverless cars will zip people about reducing auto fatalities to almost zero. As I mentioned, hypersonic flights with people around the world in a matter of hours. A recent Mars landing has boosted space interests and except for violence and accidents, most people can expect to live almost indefinitely. Technology in 2050. 3D, 3D printers will be common in every household. The 3D printers that are becoming available today. Most of the day-to-day -day objects that you will need You'll simply print at home within minutes. A computer that you'll be able to buy in 2050 will be one billion times more powerful than a computer bought in 2005, meaning just five computers in 2050 will be as powerful as all the computers that exist in the world today. A brand new industry of brain augmented performance is born. Devices such as brain enhancing memory chips will exist. Brain-to-brain -brain communications is also expected to be available. The world has shifted from only 3% of people living in cities in the 1800s to over 50% living in cities by the year 2010. Yet Australia has an 89% of its population already in 2013 living in cities. It's one of the highest and most urban, urbanized countries on the planet. However, this has already led to overcrowding cities and inadequate tra transport, particularly if you live in Sydney. Transport in the year 2050. A fast train network. This will enable an unprece unprecedented regional population boom as regional cities can become connected closely to larger cities, allowing more of our increased population to live in regional Australia and this will help reduce the overcrowding of our major cities such as Sydney and Melbourne. This means regional cities will grow and boom, especially with the infrastructure such as a fast train network and the infrastructure of a high-speed broadband. It's proposed a fast train network running from Melbourne through regional cities, Canberra, connecting to Sydney and Newcastle all the way to Brisbane via the Gold Coast. Current, I'd say the current government, the previous government, has estimated that it would take to 2065 to build a fast train network. 
at a cost of $114 billion. Some funds have been put aside already for the planning of that. However, China could build that same fast train network within five years. I'm not sure we have to wait to 2065 to have a fast train network. Brisbane to the Gold Coast with a fast train network would be connected within 15 minutes of each other, completely transforming Gold Coast and more people be able to live in regional cities. Newcastle to Sydney, as little as 40 minutes. Canberra to Sydney, as little as an hour. And Melbourne to Sydney within three hours. Meaning that's just as quick to take a train as the time you fly and get to the airport and check in. Many people travel by fast train. What will encourage a regional boom by 2050 is that already city councils such as Melbourne have estimated it costs $3.1 billion for every 50,000 households, uh, the infrastructure to be built for every 50,000 households in a city like Melbourne, about $2.6 billion in infrastructure for a city like Sydney. Yet, by, it costs only $1 billion for the same infrastructure in regional Australia to have 50,000 households. This means regional cities will grow and boom, especially with the infrastructure as a fast train network that we just discussed and high-speed broadband. Combined also with the trend of Australians, or many will work from home in the future, and the number that will derive their income from the internet with a home-based business that no longer need to commute to CBDs in cities to work. However, many that still do need to commute to cities to work can a to live in regional cities and catch a fast train into the CBD. This means people will be able to earn a city income but enjoy a country living with a lower cost lifestyle, improving living standards. Due to large cost savings to house more Australians in regional Australia, governments will provide lucrative incentives to help encourage more of the increased population to move into regional cities and decentralise government even more to base public sector jobs in regional Australia. The economy in 2050, Australia will have a sovereign wealth fund with over two and a half trillion dollars aside, providing large annual returns, boosting government income greatly, boosting the services and enabled lower taxes. This fund is funded simply by basic common sense of putting aside 10% of our annual government incomes, which currently in 2013 is $360 billion a year. Australia currently earns. By 2050, Australia has learned to diversify its economy, not to just rely on mining, which is still dominant, but to diversify into more sustainable industries. Industries such as agriculture have boomed massively by 2050. Australia discovered that after Asia needed its minerals and commodities, it would also need its food to feed its rapidly growing middle-class population. As a result, soft commodities, such as crops and wheat and dairy and beef, and has boomed because Australian farmers are some of the most efficient in the world. The government eventually decided to provide support to our fishing industries and less to our inefficient loss-making industries many decades before. As a result, agriculture boomed. Australia learns to create value-added industry after realising as profitable as it may be to sell iron ore at $150 a tonne, it's far more profitable to value-add that and sell it for thousands of dollars a tonne. Australia learns that in order to sustain a manufacturing industry, it had to not only become a high-end manufacturer like Germany did decades ago, but it also needed to innovate ways to lower its cost base, cost base of labour to be able to compete globally without lowering Australians' existing wages, which of course would never be politically popular. It did this by creating a visa fee that raised billions of dollars in new revenues to fund much needed services, as so many immigrants from around the world have wanted to relocate to Australia. Those immigrants that didn't have the capacity to pay the large upfront visa fees we're able to accept traineeship apprentice style wages for a three to five year period to gradually work their way up to award level wages. As a result, Australian manufacturing was able to better compete globally by accessing a new source of less expensive labor and immigrants who have a high work ethic and more than prepared to work their way up helped Australia boom even more 
by 2050. Australia was also able to eliminate unemployment by introducing a rule whereby after 90 days of not working, recipients had to either enter paid for study whilst continuing to look for work to upskill themselves or go to work for local council or charity groups for slightly more than the employment benefits until they found higher paid work. This ended the unhealthy habit of paying people to not work and boosted productivity and self-esteem of the unemployed and ensured almost everyone had a job and a way to contribute to the nation by 2050. Australia learnt off Singapore and decided itself to become a, one of the financial centres of the world. In fact, it turned Darwin into a Dubai, Singapore type modern day city that became a major financial centre for Asia after making Northern Australia an economic zone, modelled off the success of many economic zones in China. As a result, Northern Australia boomed. Australia finally tackled the unions that had been holding back productivity and efficiency gains with their go slow tactics and union blockades when it was found it takes three to four times longer in Australia to unload ships than many other parts of the world. As a result of union reform and more honesty and transparency and willingness to work with industry and business, Australia's product, productivity and efficiency soared. This enabled Australia to avoid dropping out of the top 20 economies by 2050 that it would have had otherwise. After Australians losing faith in the two-party duopoly, as we look at the political systems by 2050, and the emergence of micro single-issue parties controlling the Senate, leaving Prime Ministers powerless even when they controlled the lower house, a new political system was finally implemented. A new political system that enables voters to vote online as opposed to using pencil and enabled voters to vote on major policy, policy completely changed the political process in Australia and re-engaged many Australians that were disenfranchised voters who now had a direct say on the policy and the running of the country. The two-party duopoly of Labor and Liberal was no more and Australia became a much more united country as a result. Australia also left the 19th century behind by eliminating state governments well before 2050. After a Canberra University study in way back in 2009 showed that by the elimination of state governments would save $20 billion per annum to the public sector and $40 billion per annum to the private sector and another $50 billion per annum to the economy, it still took another 20 years to get rid of state governments. A phase-out 10-year strategy was used which led to a national health, education, infrastructure and transport system rather than state-based systems, thus greatly increasing Australia's efficiencies. After such sheer wastage of all three levels of governments, Australians decided to no longer tolerate large, excessive, lazy governments, but only support lean, efficient, smart, productive ones. This led to less politicians, and great respect for democracy by 2050. Everyone celebrated. Australia realised in foreign policy that its future laid, laid with Asia, and thus it decided to rebalance the relationship with the United States of America to better reflect this. As important as the US relationship is and would continue to be in 2050, Asia become equally or greater importance to Australia. And the rebalancing made a big difference. Foreign investment. Despite calls to stop foreign investment, Australia realised it heavily relied on foreign investment, but it was no longer willing to sell off all its assets and be foreign control. It realised to take foreign investment, but in a controlled way. The environment in 2050. Australia realised the great moral challenge of the 21st century perhaps wasn't in fact global warming which had a name change to climate change decades before but it was more precisely how to achieve a healthy environment and a healthy economy as, as the two must be achieved for sustainability. 
By this being the underlying organizing principle for many decades, by 2050, Australia was able to achieve an economically and environmentally sustainable nation and become a world leader and role model for other nations. It did this by changing the carbon tax years before to a carbon investment fee, whereby carbon polluters such as mining companies were able to pay a market rate fee per tonne of carbon into their own renewable energy fund. This meant not only 100% of the carbon fee went into renewable energies, it led many mining companies to eventually turn their carbon investment fee into profitable renewable energy divisions and lead the way in renewable energy. Australia realized water would become a scarce resource and in fact discovered a much larger population could not only sustain itself but solve many of its environmental problems via economies of scale. Cities like Adelaide, when its population doubled to 2 million, realized they had now had the resources to solve their water shortages. Many towns already had in 2013 the infrastructure to handle double their populations. Australia built many new dams which were initially opposed by the Greenies until they realized hydropower, which they first opposed, in fact, is much better than coal mining and coal seam gas as an energy source. Australia fixed the Murray-Darling water shortage, shortage issue by using a blue ocean strategy, by developing a smaller Snowy River style project to divert some of the Clarence River flow that enters the ocean near Grafton and Yamba over the Great Dividing Range to feed the Murray-Darling catchment with abundant fresh water. It also built new dams in nor northern Australia to capture the large water flows that flow out in the ocean and built a pipeline, pipeline directing a lot of the water to Perth and used a lot of the water to turn northern Australia into a food bowl by 2050. Education in 2050, Mark Twain once famously said, never let schooling get in the way of a good education. After realizing Australia's education system was designed in the 19th century industrialization era and needed a total overhaul, rather than just beans of more dollars thrown at it, a new modern day 21st century education was designed. Managers from the private sector were brought in to replace the old education hierarchy that had failed to deliver for decades. And the realization that to avoid most job training to be done on the job, it was best for students to be taught real life skills at school that are relevant for the 21st century. Students became engaged in learning again and many teachers were replaced by computers which become better one-to-one -one tutors and more cost-effective. It also planted seeds of financial success in the young Australians who now take more responsibility for their financial futures. This freed up large amounts of money as technology played a bigger role in education. By adding business and financial education at school, it bred a whole new breed of young social entrepreneurs, which created a jobs boom and many advancements in society. Health in 2050. Emotional intelligence was introduced to the school curriculum, which helped reduce the mental health issues that were growing. And also health education lowered the cost of health liabilities as it was discovered prevention was better than cure and the sickness industry was changed to a health industry. As more and more people become educated about health, the poor quality food that they were consuming in the past and the sugars that were in fact poisons to the body and addictive were reduced in our food. The phase out of the sale of cigarettes to anyone born after the year 2000 cut smoking use by two thirds, saving an estimated 20 billion per annum by 2050. In closing, by 2050, Australia has prospered beyond what it ever imagined and has become a culturally diverse and rich nation, one that has strong relationships with its neighbours and it's, is a role model for other nations to follow, of an economically and environmentally sustainable nation, and one with our children, that our children and grandchildren are left with a future worth inheriting. Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me thank all the three speakers for their uh, wonderful talk. Uh, my question is, looking at Australia in 2050, uh, by looking at the rest of the world, because our future is somehow influenced 
by what happens around us in this world. Now, I, I looked at one of the uh, tables that uh, Dr. Allison showed on the economy, the GDP or, of the whole uh, the world countries, and China was number one, and U.S. was number two, and so on. So my question is, will U.S. Uh, go from number one to number two uh, in a peaceful, uh, you know, happily, uh, you know, letting China take the number one seat, or is it more likely that we will see certain conflicts happening all the way around, all the way around? And what will be Australia's position in that? We got China as the uh, the main trading partner. We got one leg there, and we got U.S. as the main defense partner. We got one leg over here. So will we be caught in the crossfire, or will we have the political leadership? that has the vision and imagination to somehow steer us away from the crossfire. So I would like to hear from uh, all the three of, three of you, if, if that's all right. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very important issue and one that uh, Australia has to consider um, now and into the future, foreign policy. Uh, and as I mentioned there, 2050 Australia has managed to rebalance the relationship with the United States of America and focus more on Asia. Uh, China and Asia are our major trading partners and uh, we have to give them more weight and more respect and more consideration and we should align ourselves more closely uh, with China, uh, not to devalue the US United States relationship. Uh, that's still important, will always be important, why they are the military power and it's likely by 2050 the United States of America will still be uh, the military uh, powerhouse. Uh, in, in saying that though, I think Australia has the opportunity and the opportune uh, circumstance to be the mediator uh, between both China and the United States. I believe always there's conflict as a possibility, but I believe trade is the best way to prevent that. And uh, Australia can position itself with strong ties with both China and the United States, maintaining strong relationships with both. And by building our stronger relationship with China, I will put us in a better position to balance and reduce conflict and be able to be the mediator between the US and China when needed uh, to prevent any uh, conflict. How do you reconcile your very rosy uh, vision for the future of Australia with the insidious forces that are working behind our backs, yet in front of our noses, uh, that would seek to destroy our current society uh, to build from its ashes a Fabian utopia which seems to be the complete opposite of what Australia should be able to achieve if it had the political will. Well, thanks for the easy question. Um, no, no, it's important. Now, I do have a, a positive vision for Australia, um, but I think that's important to have the vision that you want to go after. I'm not saying that there's certainly not a lot of challenges to make that happen. Uh, one of our policies as, as a party for 20th Century Australia was honesty and transparency in government. Uh, that would make, make a big difference. But I think the shape of what's going to happen, I didn't talk about the media, but by 2050, the media will completely be changed. Like in this country, we've seen in the last election just gone, uh, that we have one major media company in this country that decided that uh, Tony Abbott would be prime minister and, and heavily pushed that. Uh, and you know, the idea of free media, free press, is that you don't have a government controlled media that pushes our government propaganda. Uh, but do we, we really have a free independent press in this country uh, when we have a, a corporate propaganda pushed out? And Rupert's entitled to his opinion of who he wants as prime minister, but that's what the opinion pages are for. Um, so I think what's going to happen and uh, is that the power of people like Rupert Murdoch will decline. They'll decline one or two ways. One, shareholders will get sick of loss-making newspapers to decide who's going to be the next prime minister. Uh, and two, the rise of social media. Um, so the rise of social media and the rise of the internet is why the question before why more and more people are educated and aware of the things that are going on. Like for instance, before September 11th, those who studied and researched via the internet would have been aware that the United States of America was already planning to invade Afghanistan uh, before September 11th. September 11th just become a handy excuse to follow through on what they already intended doing. So the, you know, Iraq, we knew that many people that studied through the internet and researched knew that uh, they were telling us lies. If you study history, most wars are entered by lies, you know, but most of the people before could only get their information through 
mainstream media and as a result didn't discover to years later that it was lies. Now we can discover it's lies before, like the Syria conflict. It's much harder for the United States to sell its agenda of why they should invade Syria. Why? Because we don't have to read Rupert Murdoch's newspapers. We can go on the internet and get updated sources of independent news. Therefore, we question before and we already know exactly what they're going to try and tell us in order to seek their agenda. Does that make sense? Because we already know their angle they're coming from. So the rise of information and media, and one of the reasons I've invested heavily in media because the only way to change a country is to diversify the media and allow more people to have their view. And the future by 2050, there won't be one or two companies controlling the media. You'll get your news from wherever you want. It'll be segmented by individual niche groups and the rise of bloggers. And as a result of that, that's the greatest thing that's stopping uh, the agenda. And September 11th was about the, the, the end of it of their ability to fool people and fool the masses and control them through fear, because the more educated we become as citizens, the more open-minded, I'm not saying jump to conspiracy, but just say open-minded and educated, the less power they have to serve and push any agenda that's not a force for good. Um, I've been wondering whether a political uh, uh, system, as, sorry, as we know it now, is compatible with a rational and responsible government, whether it is able to select a rational and responsible government, because every man has a voice, whether he is well informed, whether he has a trained mind or not, the votes are equal. And in my opinion, many votes are uh, made without being fully informed of the consequences of, of the person they elect. Um, just to clarify, so I think what you're saying is that the, our current democratic political system, uh, everyone gets a vote, I think you're saying the challenges with our current system is that um, not all voters are informed. And if we were to change to a new 21st century political system um, where voters perhaps are able to vote online, um, as we suggest, and are able to vote for major policy, um, that's what we're suggesting. Are you, uh, perhaps that you considered that voters, if they're not properly informed, um, or are you saying our current system is good and we shouldn't change it, or we should? Yeah, so I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm assuming your concern is that because if we were to change the political system, um, that maybe voters aren't able to be informed or educated. My view on that, and, and if we were to change to a 21st century political system where people were to vote online and people are able to vote, say, for major policy uh, themselves, is that I would trust voters ahead of trusting politicians in Canberra because we know many politicians are, are biased or conflicted uh, or agenda driven. Even if all voters are not properly educated, I support as a 21st century political system uh, that would serve us better is that compulsory voting would be abolished in return for enabled to vote on major policy, we would take away compulsory voting. Therefore, you don't have to vote, but if you could have a direct say in the running of the country, you would find Australians aren't actually apathetic. They actually do believe in democracy. They're just disillusioned with the current illusion of democracy. If they were given a true democratic 21st century political system, you would find Australians fully engaged. I'll give you an example. Uh, in the Howard years, I was opposed to the invasion of Iraq, but I supported Howard's economic policies. So if I wanted to vote for the Howard government at the time, how do I vote? I support some of his policies, but not others. But I'm forced to vote for a party, either them or Labor. That is not, and then they will take a mandate that they now have a mandate for all their policies, just like Tony Abbott will take a mandate that everyone supports the paid parental leave scheme, when the majority of people don't, as an example. Or uh, when Julia Gillard said there'd be no carbon tax, but then was put into power uh, by Tony Wins and Rob Oakeshott and then introduced a carbon tax. That really frustrates voters. Therefore, because we have forced to vote for two major parties, Ruddle Abbott in this election, as an example, when we want to vote on policies. 
So if we had a system where for major policy, you simply go online in 90 days time, we're going to put up for uh, same sex marriage as an example, as a major policy, let Australians vote on it. I support democracy, whatever the majority want, I'm happy to accept that. So the power is returned from our outdated 19th century political system that's been manipulated as we can see and put back in the hands of the voters. That is a true 21st century democratic political system that would fully engage Australian voters. And right now, even without changing the constitution, that could be introduced immediately. If a government in power, even like Tony Abbott said, you know what, I want to restore the power to voters. Here's what we're going to do. This major policy in 90 days, we're going to let everyone go online and vote. It might not be constitutional that Tony Abbott's government has to agree with what the vote says, but at least he could see what you actually want and then dare a government to continually go against the wishes of the people. Because what we would add to the political modern day 21st century system is a recall option, just like they have in California, that if enough people are fed up with the leader of the country or the leading party, they can put a petition together and enough people agree with it, they can recall the prime minister. You made reference to uh, Australia and um, Asia. Does that mean, are you related to Paul Keating? That's the first thing. And secondly, in uh, 2050, will there be a Governor General? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I don't believe, I'm related to a lot of people, but I don't believe Paul Keating uh, would be one of them. And I don't sit on the same side of politics as Paul Keating, but I do admit that uh, as far as Labor Prime Ministers, Keating and, and Bob Hawke were probably are far better than the more recent ones we've had from that side of politics. Um, as far as uh, the future with Asia uh, and the US, when I say we should rebalance that relationship uh, more towards Asia, I think that's just common sense. That's uh, they're our bigger trading partners. They're our future. Um, and as, as I said, US is important. Um, but I think if, if the U.S. is an ally, they need to treat their allies as allies and not dictate to their allies. And if you look back, I got the pleasure some years ago to meet Tony Blair. And obviously he lost a lot of popularity when he backed the invasion of Iraq and, uh, and the pressure that was put on by the United States to do that. I think if the allies as Australia and uh, the U.K. Uh, were to be like maybe the small brother to the US being the big brother and have the courage sometimes to challenge the US uh, when we think they may be out of line or overstepping their mark and abusing their military power for economic benefit, then we would be a better brother to the US because we could have, you, us in the UK could have perhaps influenced the United States to not go and invade Iraq and cost them a hell of a lot of money that they now perhaps regret that they did. So sometimes to have a healthy relationship risks sometimes challenging that relationship. But if we don't challenge relationships, we don't grow. The United States will always be important to Australia and uh, will always have a strong relationship. But a lapdog or, or a poodle type dictate type relationship is not healthy and is not a strong relationship. A strong relationship is an open and honest and transparent relationship. Uh, Asia and China is important and I think by strengthening our ties trading wise and otherwise with China will reduce the possibility of conflict. I do not believe China is on a mission uh, to take over the world. Uh, they have their own problems to deal with. Uh, and I think we should not be threatened or, or fearful of the rise of China. Uh, we should work with them and we should counterbalance that. Um, your last question, will there be a governor general by 2050? When I talk about uh, creating a 21st century political system, I will really want to focus on those changes that were suggested tonight about the amount of vote on major policy, uh, to be able to vote online, the removal of compulsory voting, the elimination of state governments. Um, the governor general type thing is more the debate around the Republican debate. And I think that is a distraction at this point in time. Uh, I'm not necessarily for or against. I think at some time in the future, it already was seen in the past when Malcolm Turnbull pushed the referendum that the majority of people actually would support uh, a republic model, uh, but still it didn't get passed uh, because like, it's very easy to stop a referendum. Um, but I think at this point in time, it's probably an unnecessary distraction. I'm more results focused. Let Australian voters vote on major policy. Let them vote online and, uh, 
And as a result of that, you'll have a more empowered uh, uh, voters in this country. You'll have a more passionately engaged. Uh, otherwise, what's going to happen is that uh, Australians have figured out that the Senate is where the power is. The lower house is almost a waste of time. Tony Abbott has control of the lower house, uh, but what good will that be if there's no control of the Senate? Therefore, Australian voters have figured out the powers in the Senate. You can vote for a different party in the lower house and vote for a completely different party in the Senate. And I kind of think it's ironic and I, th I think it's great to see the circus that's going to happen because it's taken the power right back out of the, the power of the political parties and putting it right back in the hands of an individual senator or one or two senators that can get very few votes but can stick it right up to major two parties. I will look forward to the day when the major two parties no longer control and dictate uh, Australian politics, but when the individuals have more power and through the Senate is where the future lies. And that is one way that we as voters can regain our power. And I look forward to uh, the games that are going to start moving forward uh, after this election.